No regrets. I mean, it happens. You know, no crying over spilled milk. It's about how we can progress and get better from here. We can't have no regrets on what we did. It just played out the way it played. I think it was just really heavy emotionally this season. Um, we all felt it. Um, I, I felt like I was letting the team down uh, at, a, at a point where I wasn't able to play. And I think it, it became a distraction at times. And, um, you know, as you see, we just had some drastic changes. But now we just, we just turn the page and uh, look forward to what we're building as a franchise and, and really get tougher. All right, if there's such a thing as a close sweep, this was a fairly close sweep. The Nets lost game one at the buzzer. They lost game two after having a 10-point halftime lead. Overall, they wound up losing the four games by a total of 18 points. You, you see on your screen there, it's about as competitive a sweep as we've ever seen in the postseason. But that's, I, I, that, that might be the, the definition of damning with faint praise. By the standards of a sweep, it was pretty close. Let's bring in my Uncle Seth, Seth Greenberg, no relation. What's your number one takeaway, Seth, from this series as it ends last night? The Celtics were a better team. They defended with a greater purpose offensively. Uh, they attacked matchups and exploited matchups. And defensively, they took the other team's best player out of the game. Having said that, how do you expect the Nets to be a good team? They had their core group together for 21 games. You don't develop an identity. You don't develop a trust. You don't develop an understanding of what it takes to win at the highest level, especially in the playoffs, when you have Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant together for only 21 games. They lacked a toughness, a discipline, uh, a commitment defensively, but the Celtics won this series flat out. So, so I think all the things you just said can be true. The Celtics deserve all the credit in the world. Their coaching staff deserves all the credit in the world. They're going on. We'll have plenty of time to talk about them. Today feels like the day to dissect what went wrong. So, J.J., having played in the league, what, 12 years? So 15, you were, 15. 15 years. 15. I shortchanged you three <laughs> wow. of them. That's my bad. Wow. However, Seth, did you hear that? However many years More you pension played, money he's taken away from you. you. You played a long time. The point that I'm trying to get to is this. Seth just said they weren't together much, which clearly yeah. was the case. I think there was a feeling amongst a lot of people, perhaps including them, that so long as they just got to the playoffs and they were together then, that they'd figure it out. Is that an unreasonable expectation or was it something about this group that they just couldn't do it? It is an un unreasonable expectation. And I think this entire season, from the Nets and the Lakers' perspective, and across the league, it's a little bit of a cautionary tale about roster construction. Tell me. Because it's very difficult to have an extremely top-heavy roster without depth, especially when that depth or your superstars are not homegrown. Kevin Artovitz a couple weeks ago had a great article on ESPN about homegrown superstars. You look at the Celtics last night. The majority of their players were drafted by Boston. Al Horford had been there before. Tice had been before. There's ownership there. The Nets, Nick Claxton was the only player that played last night that was drafted by the Nets. Right. I've said this all season. When you get down to crunch time, and we saw this in this series, when you get down to crunch time, you need two-way players on the court. Brooklyn Nets did not have enough of those. On the other side for Boston, Grant Williams, Jalen Brown, Marcus Smart, Jason Tatum, Al Horford, they've got a roster constructed of two-way players. And so there's a million different ways we can look at this thing. Let's start with K uh, Kyrie and KD, because uh, KD's going to be there. He has um, signed an extension. He's not going anywhere. Kyrie, and we'll hear more from him as the hour goes on, but he was talking about being there long term. Is that the making? And you're talking about super teams, essentially. Seth, can you put together a championship team around those two players and their skill sets? You could put together a championship team. Obviously, you got two of the greatest offensive players in the history of the game. Here's the problem. It's what about those other guys? What about three through eight? What roles are those guys going to play? You've got to have guys that fit roles that complement your two best players. This team did it. You've got to have multiple positional players. You've got to have guys who can get stops. You've got to have guys who can make shots. You've got to have guys that are going to do all the little things to help and complement these two guys. They don't have that right now. So, one, they've got to be together. Number two, they've got to find the right pieces around these two guys to open up the floor, to give them space to make plays. And then I think the other thing is, They've got to have greater agility. I thought, and, and you, you don't want to, I, I'm, I'm not trashing any coach, but that team right there did not take advantage. And a lot had to do with, obviously, they were only together 20 games. But I thought the best game Steve Nash coached was yesterday. 
of the series. Without a doubt, not even close. Go in zone, the, the way they defended, the way they uh, went with the small lineup, the way they attacked matchups. I thought that was the best preparation they had the whole, the whole series. Thank you for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.